I grew up in a low-income family in a very tiny village in the southeastern part of Nigeria. Growing up, I was introduced to a tremendous amount of uh, inadequate health care system in Nigeria. I thought it was a huge problem. Personal experiences informed me. At age nine, a 20-year-old young woman who was a youth leader in my church, no previous medical history, developed abdominal pain. The young woman was first seen in a local maternity ward. A midwife saw her, and subsequently a visiting surgeon will see the woman and diagnose her with acute appendicitis. Very common ailment but she was not to have any surgery until the money was deposited to cover the cost of her care. This was a major undertaking for a small youth group. It will take us three days to raise the money that will cover the cost of her care. But it was already too late because she died from complications of sepsis. As you can imagine, all the members of the church and the youth members we are very devastated, but we were very helpless. Four years later, a 40-year-old man, a father of two, a man who was regarded in the village as the strong man of the village, he was carrying a sack of produce on his head, going to the marketplace. He stepped into a pothole. The big weight came down on his neck. He broke his neck. Well. There was no emergency medical services to be activated. There were no trauma hospitals where she, he could have been taken to. There was no 911 to call. The local teacher volunteered the Volkswagen Beetle as a means of transporting this young man to the hospital. Bystanders got up together. They were all well-meaning. They managed to place him in the back of the vehicle, and he was transported about four hours away to the nearest hospital. Again, four days later, he died from complications of spinal cord injury without even the benefit of being seen by a surgeon, let alone a neurosurgeon. There was no CAT scan to even make the diagnosis. There was no system that can encourage a hospital that received him to transfer him to another institution where he could have received adequate care. Well, these two incidents made me wonder as a child. What, what if there was a hospital that was capable of taking care of these patients? What if there was a 911 to call? What if there was a tremendous amount of people who were trained to care for patients during the time of emergencies? What if I was the doctor? What if I was the doctor for these patients? Would they still be alive? How could I be a doctor? I grew up in a household that couldn't afford an undergraduate education. Well, my luck will change in 1982, three years after high school graduation, when a retired nurse offered to pay my tuition to go to the United States to pursue education. For she believed that in the United States, I could work and go to school. Well, so it was. But tragedy will strike again in 1983, this time much closer home. My father, the age 56, a father of six people, no previous medical history, frankly. I've never as much as seen my dad with something like a headache. And this fateful day he was eating, he choked on a piece of meat. He coughed and he thought he got it all out. Two weeks later, he's coughing up blood and will die from complications of, of the pulmonary aspiration. He didn't even have the benefit of bronchoscopy, a procedure that you can get done in five to 10 minutes in any hospital in this country. This personal loss became the greatest motivation for me to pursue a career in medicine and then surgery. Fast forward to 2002. I'd already finished medical school. I finished my surgical residency and a couple of years of uh, trauma and critical care fellowships. Now I'm gainfully employed as a trauma surgeon in Duluth, Minnesota, a town of 85,000 that enjoyed the benefits of two level two trauma centers. That means in Duluth, Minnesota, you can have any surgery done. You can have any ailment cared for in a hospital. 
in a town of 85,000 that wasn't even possible, remotely possible, in even the largest metropolitan city in my native country. So this disparity in care was too much for me to bear. Something has got to change, unless what befell me as a child was isolated. I didn't think it was. But how could I possibly change the system in a large sub-Saharan West African country? I didn't have the political collections. I didn't have the wealth. All I had at this point in time was two years of experience in postgraduate medicine practice. But I had a will that something was going to change, and I would start somewhere. So with the help of friends in 2004, Vincent Obiyama Haju Memorial Foundation was established. The sole purpose of this organization, the 501c3, was to begin to study the problem in Nigeria and see ways to make change so people are not dying needlessly. In 2009, the board of directors of the Boone Foundation decided to launch a visit to Nigeria. We have to study the problem. We have to understand the magnitude of it. And then we have to decide how is it that we're going to, solve, to begin to uh, produce some solutions. So we traveled to Nigeria, visited several large institutions, including all the teaching hospitals in Nigeria. We met with folks in the US Embassy and the Consulate Office. We interviewed patients um, uh, in the, in this house, some of the patients in these hospitals. We went to the oil companies. We went to the local National Institute of Health. We met with countless private citizens. And what did we learn from that experience? Well, we learned that you were hard pressed to find any Nigerian family that hadn't experienced the sort of thing that befell me at childhood. They either personally or they knew somebody who did. We also learned that in a country of over 180 million people, there was not even a single healthcare system that could compared to what you will find in an average hospital in the rural United States. We knew there were no emergency medical services. As if that wasn't enough, we also learned that almost a billion dollars left the country, medical tourism, for people who went out in search of better health care, and most of those things related to surgical specialties. We learned that the available teaching hospitals were faced with several internal and external factors that really made it impossible for them to thrive. They did not have portable water supply. They didn't have constant electricity. Sanit sanitation was just pretty much left to choice. As if that was not enough, there is tremendous amount of brain drain in the country. So several physicians that are trained within the country left. Nurses left, all in search of better employment. And in fact, th what that saddens me most is the fact that people who went outside to self-specialize couldn't return back to the country to provide care because there was no system that they could function under because there were no healthcare system. You didn't, if you were a neurosurgeon or an orthopedic surgeon or somebody like myself, an, a trauma surgeon, I couldn't go back and practice there because there were no hospitals that can support that sort of practice. So we came away deciding, therefore, that the country needs a healthcare system with major emphasis in emergency health medical services. But how do you begin to tackle this problem? Well, it kind of reminded me of the old African addict that says, how do you eat an elephant? The Boom Foundation decided to start eating an elephant one bite at a time. So 2011, we launched another mission. This time around, it was a non clinical mission. We had to educate. We had to try to train people on how to identify patients who will become critically ill. Because once you became critically ill and required to be in an ICU, that was a death sentence. So perhaps if we can prevent that from happening, we can save lives. We offered courses in advanced trauma life support. We offered fundamental critical care support, advanced cardiac support, and rural trauma team development courses we were able to train over 300 physicians and nurses in that visit. But we were also able to understand that at this time, cardiovascular disease was a major killer in Nigeria. And in fact, it accounted for 
majority of the reasons why people left the country in search of care. We learned that most of these patients that died from cardiovascular disease that required surgery were young adults. Young adults who, as children, had infection, streptococcus, minor thing that you will take penicillin and be okay. They were not well treated. And so now, as young adults, they're developing heart disease, rheumatic heart disease that acquired their valve to be replaced. We also learned there were a lot of children with congenital cardiac malformations. These are children who come from the middle class and the lower class where they didn't have any per good perinatal care during pregnancy. So they needed surgery to correct these defects. We also learned that our host institution, the University of Nigeria Teaching Hospital, a thousand bed hospital, did not have a functional ventilator in place. So what it means is, if you were so sick that you needed to be in the ICU, if you had something as little as respiratory failure from pneumonia, and you needed to be on the ventilator just for a short period of time while you recovered, somebody's gonna have to bag you. It was a resident or family member. You either got well or you died. If you had any major surgery that would require you to be on the ventilator for a short period of time after surgery, likewise, somebody's gonna have to volunteer to bag you or you died. So surgeons didn't dare do any complex cases that by chance can land you in the ICU. We also learned that this institution was once the center of excellence for cardiac surgery. Open heart surgery was started in this institution in 1974 and continued until 2003 when it shut down for, due to a lot of factors. So coming back from UNTH in 2011, the Boom Foundation had to reorganize. This time around, we knew perhaps what we need to do is focus on the cardiac surgery. So we were now going to work with the University of Nigeria Teaching Hospital to try to restart the program that has been dormant now for 10 years. To this end, in 2013, March 2013, we launched the first open heart surgery medical mission to the UNTH. We took surgeons, anesthesiologists, perfusionists, and nurses. We brought with us everything that was necessary to complete six operations successfully. Now we have proved that it can actually be done. It can be done. So where are we today? It's been three years now. Boom Foundation has been sponsoring four to five missions every year. And we have been able to complete successfully a total of 130 cases. Now this contrasts to 120 cases that were performed at the University of Nigeria Teaching Hospital in the 26 years the program was open, prior to closure in 2003. Not only have we been doing surgeries there, we have been able to train the local physicians and the nurses to begin to take care of some of these patients, both perioperatively and postoperatively. Our goal, obviously, will be that as time goes on, the more they are able to assume better responsibilities and roles, this institution should be able to conduct about 200 to 300 cases Every year. So, as a child, I asked so many questions. As an adult, I've tried to answer some of these questions with some measurable success. I know that I returned to Nigeria with the Boom Foundation with a goal to try to establish a world class healthcare system major emphasis in emergency medical services. But we soon learned that by collaborating with the teaching hospital, not only were we able to build personnel in dedicated space, but we were also able to tackle cardiovascular disease, which was a major killer in Nigeria. Now, we know that as time goes on, we hope to be able to develop better resources, better relationships with philanthropic and healthcare organizations that will allow us to increase our capacity to be able to take care of a greater number of people. So we will eventually come back to the original idea of building a world-class healthcare system with focus on emergency medical services. Why? Because it will be 
what will help us to stem the immigration of patients outside of the country while we are also able to take care of majority of the, of the indigenous patients just like my father. But for now, I think that Boom Foundation and I will continue to heal hearts for my father's land. Thank you. <laughs>